Hi, everybody. You may notice a change in the background here. This is a conversation we had to record prior to today's events. But I wanted to, first of all, start by saying thank you very much to Kelly and Ryan. And we're going to bring on uh, our next speaker, who definitely has ties to what Kelly and Ryan have been doing. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to someone who couldn't be with us live today. So we've pre-recorded this beforehand. Former US Chief Data Scientist, DJ Patil. He's a fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center and has been working tirelessly to help with the COVID pandemic over the last six to eight months. How are you doing, DJ? I'm doing great. Well, I'm not doing great, to be honest, because if you look at the COVID numbers, but I just also just quick want to say hello. And it's, you're all so lucky to hear from Kelly. Kelly Jin is one of the all-stars of, of, of the data world and how to use it with cities. So uh, let's talk about using it with states and nations then to segue smoothly on that. Can you tell us a little about how you've spent the last eight months of your life? So normally in my day job, I'm responsible as CTO for Devoted Health. And, and Devoted Health has a mission to build a healthcare system that you would want to put your parents in, that you would want to put any loved one you have in. And we, we really focus on the portion of the population we don't talk about those that are more elderly, and also those that have a lot of chronic or other health conditions. And so we're responsible for their entire form of health. And so as we started to see COVID really start to spread across the country, not only the country, around the world, one of our things we were terrified by is that our population is square in the bullseye of COVID. And we really watched it and started worried about how do we get the safe protocols and then we also unfortunately saw the incredible lack of leadership from the federal government. And that's what has led me to really spend so much time being focused on COVID these days. It really seems like unlike prior health crises, even something like the, the AIDS epidemic, this is one of the first times when a for-profit healthcare nation has realized that the health of the person standing next to them on the subway affects them. In the past, if the person was, you know, was dealing with cancer and they were next to me, it didn't affect me. And, and mm -hmm. has that changed public sentiment despite what we see in the headlines, or is it still hard to get agreement on that? The challenge is, one, is people are just, for lack of a better term, they're just losing the ability to appreciate what the science says. And that is because we have unfortunately in, in the United States, a leader who is undermining that scientific message. So this idea and this question of what does it really mean? What are you at risk? When aren't you at risk? Should you wear a mask? All these different things, they become philosophical debates. People talk about where does COVID policy get really figured out? Unfortunately, it's really in your living room. Are you a family that wants to go out and hang out at, a, at an indoor restaurant? Are you a family that really believes in masks, doesn't believe in masks? Are you a family that even takes your flu shot or not? And I hope everyone in the audience has at least taken their flu shot. If you haven't, I please hope you will, because this is going to be uh, a, a strong flu season with COVID. And that's those, those kind of things, we really need to be able to think about public health. If you kind of wind this back a little bit to give you an example of where this has been a challenge for the last few years, we have an incredibly troubling movement of people who are questioning just sound science around vaccines. Should you get a vaccine? Measles vaccines, things that we know are critical for our society. And, and that, that destruction of, of that, that belief in science leads to death. Yeah, my mom told me she remembered she was born in the 40s. She remembered coming back to school after the holidays to see who had died of polio and, you right. know, not going swimming in rivers and stuff. And they looked at it as a miracle. So one of the things I've heard over and over again uh, is this idea that the government is responsible for delivering what people need and the private sector is responsible for delivering what people want. What did the private sector teach you about making people want the science? Well, the first that we know is that what the private sector is really good at is taking the spark that government can do and then nurturing that flame into something really powerful. The best example of this recently is autonomous cars. And here in the United States, the initial program that kind of led to this was kicked off by research in the Department of Defense under an agency called DARPA. And they had this grand challenge to try to build self-driving cars that would go across a desert. 
that really has led to all this innovation and that other people are working on. The similar aspects happen there with science. The basic science for so many things is funded here in the United States by the National Institute of Health. That is similarly, that research is used not just here in the United States, it's used around the world. The people who actually take that science and put it into practice happens in a couple dimensions. One is public health. Public health is everything from how do you think about sexually transmitted diseases? How do we think about diabetes, too much sugar in, in soda, those kind of issues, all of that together, smoking secession programs. And then you also have the, the hospital systems and the delivery mechanisms and the actual care models and how do you afford and pay it. All those have to come together because the adage is what you really want is prevention. An ounce of prevention is so much more than the cost later on. Yeah. So when you are in the private sector, you kind of have to convince people to do something. Uh, when you're in government, you have different tools for coercing behavior, legislation and so on. Are you seeing governments apply sort of behavioral psychology, behavioral economics to get people to follow best practices? Or is this something that just leads to more like, ah, the government's trying to manipulate me? Mm -hmm. Well, it, there's parts that are really good and there's parts that are a challenge. So the parts that are, that, that, that are a challenge right now is if the leader of your country shows that they don't need to wear a mask or they give voice to those that just have nonsensical arguments, you're, you're, you're creating a behavioral model and paradigm that, allow, that uh, undermines good, solid science. And it, it, that's, that's just a kind of a form of what it might be called advertising. There's another side of this where public health and other things have always been used with been effective through forms of, of, of good behavioral economics or in good advertising as well. So for example, one of the most famous ones was a drug ad during the Reagan era about this is an egg and a very hot frying pan saying, this is your brain and it shows the egg and then it says, crack the egg and it says, this is your brain on drugs. One of the things that was done in the Obama administration, this was led by Maya Shankar, was the creation of uh, an office that is on social behavioral theory. And the idea was there is how can you actually get good policy out there? How do you get people to do things that are needed? Some of these areas are maternal health, making sure that women in their early part of the pregnancy are getting the right vitamins, getting the right care, all of these things that are essential for good outcomes. But there's so much more. There's simple things such as where do, on a tax return, do you sign at the end of a document or do you sign at the beginning of the document that you're attesting that this is that this is all factually filled out? Turns out if you sign the document at the beginning and say, I now I'm going to fill this out correctly, people are going to be much less likely to lie on those on those forms. And so that reminds me of the German, the German organ donor thing compared to Austrian organ donors. Right that all the policy in the world is not gonna make a difference if you're opt in versus opt out, right? It's like a 90% difference in organ donation. That, that's right. One of the things that, that, that people don't always realize is, and that some of the things of policy, is policy is about how do you achieve, like defi define what a good outcome is and how, what are the mechanisms that you actually have to make that real? And in, in that process, some of the things that, that, that often are the huge levers that people don't realize are those small little tiny things that get put in. You know, for example, the creation of the Ni National Science Foundation here in the US was basically just a semicolon add online in an, a big appropriations bill, a spending bill. But so was the, the idea of, hey, in the department of, of, of driver, like basically how you get your driver's licenses, that you could use that as the vehicle to uh, enable people to identify as an organ donor because that is the best distribution way. One of the ones that we're gonna be faced with right now is how are we going to get vaccines out so effectively? And if you think about it here, at least here in the United States, there are two things everyone has access to. One is a post office, the other are libraries. And so maybe we should think about using those as vehicles as distribution points for vaccines. Yeah, I think people haven't thought about these issues at scale. It's very hard to conceive of like a million tests. I mean, I've had one jab up the nose. 
uh, just because I was at a gallery that someone later in the day turned out to be positive for. And I was like, okay, may as well go in case. It was a very smooth process. This is Canada. It went pretty fluidly. And then, you know, I still haven't received a text saying I'm positive or negative. My girlfriend called and they told her when she asked. And I'm like, wait, that may be a GDPR violation. And they didn't text me back. So even a well-managed policy here in Canada didn't manage itself as well as possible. I mean, I didn't even have to pay for parking, which was great. But it does seem like a lot of this legislation, and this is a theme that's been coming up in the weeks leading up to Forward 50, as I talk to many of our speakers, it's not just that we have to build digital interfaces to support existing legislation. It's that legislation needs to be written with, with enactment or with delivery in mind. Mm -hmm. That if you write legislation right. that's thinking about how it will be delivered digitally, not only does the legislation wind up getting simpler and you can embody some of the conditions of the laws in the app, how do we get the people writing policy to think about the, the implementability of their policy in a digital world? So you're raising one of the most important things that we see these days. The way we describe it, what, to, especially to technologists, is imagine you saw the original policy memo for the Affordable Care Act. This is the Affordable Care Act here in the United States, what led to you needed a, a way to give people access to healthcare, and so that became healthcare.gov. If you look at that original policy memo, any technologist would say, you, you want to do that through a website? How are you going to make sure that that scales? You know, it would be almost obvious to us. Another version is healthcare interoperability, the ability to move health records between different systems. Their whole thing when it was really written in the Recovery Act with, and it allowed $35 billion US to, to fund these things, you'd say, well, what kind of companies are we gonna create? What, where's our, where are our standards? Who's gonna define this stuff? Things that were our natural questions where our head goes. And so the version of this that you need is we have to think about our table being bigger. In policy circles, very often you have a table or a conference room and there's somebody from communications or somebody from a legal team, there's somebody from a policy shop or multiple policy shops, but there's no chair for the technologist. And then what happens? That's, that's the case even today because it seems like that seems like a pretty obvious thing is to bring the implementers and the testers in early on. It is. It's still too not enough. And the reason it's not enough, it's too often policy people think, look, we wrote it and then we just give a consult to the technologist or the delivery person. What you have to do is it has to be truly integrated. It has to be an incredibly organic process to design it together. And that's really what we realized towards the end of the Obama administration is that you need this novel approach. You really need this combined DNA. You have to have people who actually know this, like there's this new hybrid. And Kelly Jinn is one of these people. Originally at the White House, she was part of the Domestic Policy Council before going to Boston, working on analytics, and then coming back to the White House and working in the Chief Data Scientist office. That, that, that kind of hybrid person is exactly what you need. COVID, by the way, COVID is a, one of the best examples of this right now. Everyone talks about testing. Nobody talks about how you're going to collect that data. And so what, what happens is people say, oh, you can just use the existing architecture. Now, Alistair, like you would look at this system or I would look at this system and be like, can the system handle 100x or 1,000x the load? Because normally that system is designed for identifying cases of tuberculosis or some AIDS, but it's not designed for a pandemic. So what naturally happens? When tests happen, one, you might, you know, somebody takes a swab, jams up your nose, you may take another form of a test. Where does that get recorded? How do we make sure it's timely done? How do we make sure that data is responsibly used to, for, for protection of privacy? And I saw, I saw a thing you, you published with Amazon about how you retool things. Can you give us like a five minute tour of like what, when you got the call in January and decided that you would take a, a leave of absence to go work on COVID and then finding out what that infrastructure was like. And then some of the stuff I saw you doing with AWS to scale things 10 to 100x. Uh, can you talk us through that a little bit? Sure. So what happened in the early portion of times, this is California had about uh, roughly eight deaths. And we just happened to be on a phone call talking to a friend in the, in the California government, just tr trying to say, hey, if we're, we're here, if we can offer advice, we weren't trying to push for anything. Just, just trying to basically say, 
how can we help? And they said, hey, we're trying to think through all these different systems and we don't, not sure what to do. And so in that call, we said, hey, would you just like us to come up there tomorrow? And so Todd Park, Bob Kocher and myself and, and um, a few others just decided to drive up to Sacramento and camp out. Now we weren't camped out, like a lot of times people think we're camped out in the governor's office or something fancy. We were in the back offices of the California Department of Transportation where the real work happens. And when in our first process of that, we realized that there were no models. Like all the models that people were doing were off of spreadsheets. And that's no fault of California's. Remember, public health hasn't been invested in really. A oh yeah, I mean, I saw this thing about the UK lost data because they ran out of rows in a spreadsheet. That's right. And it turns out they didn't just run out of rows in a spreadsheet. When you dig in, they ran out of rows in an XLS spreadsheet because one of the older systems had the right. old row limit. Because when I heard that number, I'm like, wait, Excel has a lot of rows. Right. Turns out, turns out it was four to six rows per data record. And then my head exploded because that's not a data record. So like you've got four to six variable number of rows on a spreadsheet that's XLS. So it's 65,000 rows mm -hmm. sitting in a basement somewhere. And that's the stopgap. That's the, that's the, the choke point for all this data. That's so right. when you got in there, what did you find? Well, to, to your point, by the way, one of the most powerful things that we found during the Ebola response was that what people needed was not a spreadsheet, but a shared spreadsheet. So in that case, having access to Google Docs at the time was people were able to update their data, you know, and kind of give us a much more up-to-date view, a holistic view of what's going on. When we got to the California side, the first thing was, where's a model? And is there a model? And we were able to identify this really great model from Justin Lesseter at, at, at John Hopkins because it- So I, I just want to interrupt you just for a second. Mm -hmm. For the layperson, because some of our audience don't work in health or data modeling, can you explain what a model is? Sure. So the model effectively, there's a number of types of models. Probably the easiest to think through is a model that really just, that, that, that really, it, it, it moves, it takes a group of people who are what you might call symptomatic and, and they are infected. They first get infected, they become symptomatic, they go through different stages of COVID and they go through recovery. In that process, they can affect other people. And so it's a simulation that allows you to kind of see, hey, what's the spread of COVID over the next few days, few weeks, or months, depending on, on the type of model. And so this allows us to say, if we know that there's a certain number of people who are infected in California, what should we expect to happen over the next month? And what we did is we took that, that model and it it, and th there's a whole lot of things in these simulations that make it more complex, complicated. Think of like a weather model, because what you want to be able to say is, well, what if people move from Sacramento to LA and one of them's infected? Then what's the spread in LA? What happens if they move to another rural place that that's you know maybe a town of 200 people? What what happens there? And then you want to say, well, how many hospitals do you have? And is a capacity going to be overloaded? And so you can start making this very, very sophisticated. And what the models, the models unfortunately took to, to run multiple simulations would take seven days to run. We didn't have seven days. And so two really great data scientists, engineers. So, uh, sorry to cut you off. I just want to try and understand this. So I have a model and I go in and I say, look, it turns out people aren't wearing masks as much as we thought. I got to go change the percentage of people wearing masks, for example. That's right. Yeah, think of it as- And I got to run it again and it takes seven days? Well, exactly. That's the problem. Wow. Because think of it like these these are these are running not on big supercomputing infrastructure. They're running under some researcher's desk, literally. That, that's, that's what they are. They're just running on a, on, a, on a normal hardware. And so Sam Shaw, who was one of the key engineers who scaled and implemented people you may know at LinkedIn, and Josh Wills, who was at Cloudera and, and, and Slack and helped scale Slack. Alistair, you both know them pretty well. They, they kind of volunteered their time and they jumped in with this research team from John Hopkins and they got the model jointly with an Amazon web service team. Werner Vogel basically said, gave us, was kind enough to help us just get a whole bunch of compute resources. And we deployed it and we got the model to run, came down from seven days to 30 minutes. And, and so that allowed us to say, what if this? What if this? 
I mean, that really it. lets you like get a coffee and reflect, right? Which is, I exactly. think, exactly, yeah. And and that it's it's. I'm not sure if everybody knows what the OODA loop is, but there's this concept in 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 war of getting inside the the cognitive loop of your enemy. That that when you are acting faster than your enemy can react, your maneuvers become mysterious to them, and you can just see what they're doing very obviously. And it was started out in fighter pilots, but like when you're facing an adversary, you need to get inside the cycle time. And it seems to me like at the very least, you need to be inside inside the cycle time of infection and transmission for the pathogen you're tracking in order to make any progress. Right. So remember at this time point in time, the only data we had was out of Wuhan, which was up for debate. We had data from two cruise ships and a little bit of information out, out of Italy. That's all we had. We did not know what percentage of people, once they got infected, were going to need to be hospitalized, what percentage go from hospitalization to the ICU, what percent go from ICU to ventilators, what's the probability of death. We had none of that. And so you just have to run lots and lots of simulations to try to get your head around it. And this is one of the important things. We all pattern match to things that we know. So people are pattern matching COVID to flu. They're matching it to measles. But COVID is a different disease. And, and this is why what we say is like, is, is our understanding of viruses, we can understand it a certain amount. But when you think about the spread at a pandemic level, this is why COVID is so weird. Like what, it, doesn't, it doesn't transmit just like the flu. It, it doesn't react. So it's very more bursty. And, and people get infected in these super spreader events rather than kind of uniform. And it does seem like public policy, oh, we might not have enough masks, so let's not tell people to wear masks. Oh, we don't want to spook the economy. Once you start to get out of the realm of pure science and you run headlong into other conflicting public policies, public servants who are the bulk of the attendees and audience for the conference today, really, they're, they're stuck in what has been referred to as nudge and sludge. Nudge mm -hmm. being the encouragement of a policy that already existed and sludge being the the deceleration of that policy. So there might always have been a policy about incarcerating people at the border, but you can enforce it more or less at, based on the sort of whims of the executive. How do you tackle the, because science has sort of absolutes. I mean, they're not certainties, but there's definitely like, look, we know the model has these parameters, do these things. And then public policy runs headlong into other concerns like mental health of people who are isolated or business leaders going bankrupt and not be able to pay their health care bills and then getting sick. What does that like? How how does the how does the wonk and the policy person bring a good dis, good argument? Like, what's the best you can do as a public right. servant to show up to that meeting and and state your case? Mm -hmm. So the the first I gotta say is to all the public servants, thank you. You know, like you you do you do a job that people do not appreciate. Security is like air; you only know it you need it when you don't have it. And that's what public servants are. You are the heir in the security for so many things that people don't appreciate. So just know that you have not only my thanks, but my family's thanks for all you do. Part of what there is critical is, as we've seen in, in the discussions of trying to figure out what good policy is, is also COVID exposes our flaws of how we structure bureaucracy. COVID doesn't care that the Department of Public Health is different from some economic department or transportation department. It, COVID doesn't care about geographies. It doesn't care about the difference between states and local counties and cities. It, 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 is, it, is, it, it requires a radically broad-based approach. And, and there's so many issues. You kind of have to ask, what is our Maslow's hierarchy? And, and your point is extremely spot on, Alistair, is that we talk about OODA loop all the time. This is this boy, James Boyd, uh, Colonel Boyd's idea, which is first you got to observe. Can we observe? Then can we orient? Then can we make a decision? And then can we action it? So first, can we observe? No, we can't observe. Why can't we observe? Because we don't have enough testing. We don't have ways of tracking that testing and figuring out how to get it back. What do we need? We need radically gigantic scale testing and... We need what's called surveillance testing, the idea of randomly testing people or testing a set, specific set of population over and over again to get a sense of what is going on. Second, 
orient. Do we have a theory of what's going to happen? Can we make decisions? Who are the decision makers? How do we come to those tension points? And then how do we actually implement it quickly? And when I say quickly here, this whole thing on COVID happened, has to happen in the span of a day. You've seen this over and over again. It's like somebody says, yeah, we've got this. We have nailed COVID. And then two weeks later, after opening up a little bit, boom, it all explodes on. That's not just the U.S., that's happened in, in Asia, it's happened in Israel, it's happened, you know, so it's happening across the UK right now, not just the UK, but the whole EU. So we have to have this approach of how are we going to get ahead of COVID? And, and for those that are thinking, well, maybe we just need to kind of muddle through and punch through COVID and herd immunity and all that stuff. The math doesn't support you. The math does not support you. Because if you think about the United States where we have as low amount of disease spread as we do right now, we have had more than 200,000 people dead at this point. 200 people who have died, more than a, a many of our wars, our last few wars combined. And, and so you can't just punch through this. You have to think of this. And then the other thing, Alistair, I would just emphasize, COVID is not the big one. Everyone's like, oh, this is a pandemic. This is not the big one. This is not pandemic flu. Luckily, that the case fatality ratios, that the amount rate of people die is much lower. Yeah, if COVID and, were a combination of slow, like long transmission before fatality with a high fatality rate, we'd be looking at, you know, extinction level events. That's, yeah. It's, yeah. Like the attitude of COVID would be really different of people going to bars and everything if it was suddenly like, well, if you got COVID, you were going to be impotent as a male. So I think the movie Contagion, like the, the one thing that was wrong about that movie was that the death was so horrible that everyone went, oh crap, right? That was the one thing they got wrong is it's actually more insidious for the death to happen far away, slowly and unobservably, right? Yeah, um, the death, by the way, the, the, the impact of COVID is going to be horrible. We're not going to see it for five years. Right. Because yeah, chronic the conditions, stuff. mental, exactly. The, the chronic conditions... If there are pulmonary, renal, cardiac, cardiovascular issues, people are going to be on disability. Right. People are like, and then we're not even talking about the education and the generational, the generational divide because of education and poverty that's going to be created here. So one of the things that has come up in conversations preparing for this year's event is the willingness to take risks. I had a great conversation with Canada's president of shared services, who is responsible for delivering all of our shared services in Canada, Paul Glover. And he talked about the idea of risk taking and how we need to obviously take more risk and experiment more. But one of the things we concluded is if you're building a battleship, it's really hard to like update the battleship. You gotta go build a new one, right? Or roll back to the previous battleship. But when you have code, you can push out a new model, you can put out a new app, and you can roll back with like the changing of a file system. And so it seems like as in a digital world, we are much better equipped to experiment. Now, <clears throat> the other day I was driving past a building that was on fire. And it was on fire in a controlled way because it was a bunch of firefighters testing. And there were ambulance trucks outside and they were ready for emergencies. The time that they chose to take a risk was when they could control all the other conditions. They could have an ambulance waiting outside. Someone else knew the building. There was a spare set of firefighters to come in and save them. And that's how they trained. It seems like we as humans are willing to take risks and experiment in a crisis, but that's like the worst time to do it. I mean, Jesse Robbins was talking last year about emergencies and resilience and the idea of uh, chaos monkeys and breaking things when you know where they're broken. How come humans can't experiment when we're safe and we're only good at, at adapting and taking risks when the crisis deserves it? And how do we fix that? The best people are public servants. Their, their job is to think ahead. You know, one of the things that comes to mind is after we saw Ebola in the Obama administration, so many tabletop exercises were run. And there was a team that was set up inside the, the National Security Council at the White House. And they have a thick binder of turn to page 32 if this happens. Because you you have to plan it out. Other, otherwise, it's too hard to reinvent. Is it still a binder? It's not a wiki at this point? Well, it, I can't say the many different ways it's actually there. It sounds so, like a choose your own disaster game, right? Exactly, right? And, and the, the point of this, and even during the transition, 
and this is well documented, um, during the transition to, for, from Obama to the Trump administration, they, the teams were run through those exercises. Wilbur Ross, who was a secretary of commerce, was in that meeting and fell asleep. They've taken, they, they basically fired that whole team that was responsible for making sure that when the pandemic happens, you'd have the response. What we haven't seen, at, and that's just at the federal level, we haven't had that ability for states to truly get ready. And, and that is a lack of investment of, of public health. And, and, that it, it, and it, that's been a decade long here in the United States. The yeah, I saw some stuff that the U.S. spends like two and a half percent of its all medical spending goes to public health and the rest is private. Like it's a, I, I don't know if the exact amount, but it's a staggeringly yeah. low for a country that right. spends more money on healthcare than any other country. It is a very low percentage on public. Well, health. I think one of the ways to think about it is we're really interested in treatment, spending money on treatment. We're not interested in spending money on prevention in the appropriate way. It's hard to invoice prevention, right? Exactly. It's hard. And people, this is kind of this, this, it, it, it's, you get complacent uh, on these things. The part to your, your point about risk taking, one of the things that is important is how do you actually get constructive signal back? And, and experiments are happening all the time. We just don't get to see it. That one city implements policy another way. We're seeing the worst form of this right now where every school district is implementing their own different version of COVID protocols. It reminds yeah. me of when, when Gates was criticized for sending like water to one village in Africa and books to another. And people said, well, you can afford to send them all, all these things. Why don't you? And he said, because then I won't know what to do for the whole world. That's right. Something and, like that. Yeah. Like th this idea that, that you have to experiment to make the best use of your resources and you have to do so in a controlled way because we are in the middle of probably the biggest social experiment humans have ever been through. I mean, right. everything from air travel to, you know, carbon emissions, we're doing split testing around the world right now. But if we're not doing it in a controlled way, we're, we're squandering the opportunity. Well, not just that. I, I agree with everything you're saying. I would add one other place to, to look for is that there are the natural place we should all, our heads should go is what about the ethical issues here? And the place where to really look at that is how people think about from the biomedical space. And what does it mean to test appropriately to figure out when does the test move forward? How does it not, especially for vaccines? Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of work there that's been done by ethicists that we should leverage across broader policy. So we're almost out of time. This is fascinating. And thank you again for spending, taking time away from your busy schedule to even be here with us today. What other crises should we be using data for more? I mean, what else is in a spreadsheet and needs to be in a fast model today so that we can do experiments before the crisis is upon us? One of the greatest ones that's upon us right now is climate change. And, and we have an extraordinary parallel that we don't have disease forecasting centers. We don't have the appropriate climate centers. We don't invest to, to, for those sophisticated models. And so people may say, oh, well, there's lots of supercomputers and other things for weather. We still don't even have an observational network to understand how the currents move in the ocean, what happens with deep surface movement of water. So we have to have the ability to actually not only know those pieces, we have to be able to put this together with policy. What if people have to move? What does relocation look like? There are some extraordinary thorny problems that we need the best thinkers on for, for those things and asking, how are we going to learn fast? We have to get inside the OODA loop of climate change, and we're not. I've, uh, there's two pieces of science fiction I'm eager to consume in the next 12 months. One is Apple's uh, remake of, or the television series for Foundation, the Foundation mm -hmm. trilogy. Uh, and one is Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future, which is all about near fiction combating climate change. It seems like governments should set up ministries for the future. You know, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the lines I've been spouting a lot lately is that Capitalism treats the future as an externality. What is gonna, what's it going to take, and obviously this varies by country, to create a ministry for the future? Mm -hmm. Well, the first is it depends which portion of the government it, it's, it's in, right? The legislative or the, the, the executive branch, if you will. I believe every team needs some small group that is thinking forward ahead. One of the famous teams is at the Pentagon that is responsible for thinking like, hey, five, 10 years, 20 years down the horizon and coming back with the best thinking. That thinking, it's, it's, it's oftentimes like you read it and you're just like, nah. But enough time has gone by where you're like, oh, 
geez, that's really spot on. They're the ones that also in the, the Department of Defense have called out 20 years ago issues of climate change. And here we are. And, and so I think everybody needs some form of that. Now, the same and, and, and the scary part about the foundation series, of course, is that he has a science. It's essentially predictive data science. And he's like, I got a good enough model not to know the details of what's going to happen, but to know that the next thousand years will be a very dark period for humans. What do I do to make it a thousand years instead of 10,000 years, which is a really dark way to yeah. look at things. And I think that's a that's a, a level of acceptance that we see in a lot of literature today. We're just going to have to batten down the hatches and somehow we'll get through this as opposed to we're going to innovate our way out of it with you know carbon capturing concrete or bugs that eat plastic and so on. How does government balance, hey, we can fix this with innovation. We can't solve today's problems with today's technology versus, hey, we've got to be more careful. We've got a lower population. We got to start rationing food. Like there's, there's a balance between being well behaved and conserving and being sort of ruthlessly innovative and trying to fix it. How do we find that line? Cause it seems like that's the source of tension is do we try and innovate our way out of this problem or conserve our way out of it? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm firmly in the camp of, we need to spend our very precious resources on investment. Every time we have placed a bet on it in, in investment, whether it's a human genomic project, it's going to the moon or other things, that pays off dividends 10 times over easily. Sometimes, many times, 100, 1,000 times over in many cases. The more we do that, the more we're going to find a way for us to open up new opportunities and new thinking to think forward. And what we have to ask also is all that technology goes out are what are the downside consequences and how do we actually appropriately make sure that this isn't going to have uh, another type of effect that is going to pull us backwards. But one of the things I would just emphasize to everybody in here is that it's very, that the, the easy North Star, the North Star that's always been there for me, is what do we need to do today to ensure that we are doing the right things policy-wise to make the world a little bit better today for our kids and our kids' kids? And if you just focus on those policy vehicles, you'll get to the right things. Awesome. Well, that's a perfect place to wrap things up. Thank you so much for joining us today virtually. One of the one of the good things about the current crisis is this magic teleportation and time distortion we get by recording stuff. And thanks on behalf of everybody, I'm sure in the US, but also around the world for the work you've been doing and continue to do. Have a great day. And it's great to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me.